This week we're going to deal with uh, chapter 8 and chapter 10. The reason I skipped chapter 9 is because I didn't really skip it. We're going to do it next week. Uh, but the reason I put 8 and, and 10 together is because they're both part of uh, cognitive psychology. And I thought it didn't make any sense to me that, uh, that uh, they were separated like that. Uh, so we're going to put them together this week. Uh, the first chapter, of course, we're going to deal with is chapter 8, which uh, is, is deals with memory. Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. There we go. Okay, deals with memory. And the first thing we're going to talk about is my mother. Uh, my mother died in 2013. Um, I think, yeah. Well, no, 2014. Uh, 2014, she was... Uh, 98 and a half years old. Um, I visited her uh, toward the end. I visited visited her quite a bit, and um, one time uh, we were we were sitting outside, and the cat came along uh, with a really strange look on her face, and she had a mouse in her mouth, of course. And uh, she, my my mother, uh, quoted this poem by uh, William Blake called "The Tiger." Uh, and she quoted it verbatim. Uh, she made one mistake, and I don't remember where the mistake was. But uh, this is what the, the this is what the poem is: uh, "Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine, thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire?" And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he... Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful, fearful symmetry? Um, and she quoted this. This was about uh, two months before she died. Uh, it was in March, and she died in April. I guess it was only one month before she died. Anyway, uh, she died of old age, uh, and here she was uh, at, uh, at 98, uh, years and, and five months, and she was quoting a poem that she had memorized in the third grade, um, more than almost, uh, almost, yeah, 90 years before, uh, she had, she had memorized it in the, in the, the third grade. Uh, the reason she memorized it is because the, uh, teacher, uh, didn't, she assigned this this poem, and she didn't think anybody would understand it, and she didn't think that anybody would uh, be able to read it, and she treated my mother like she was, she had a mental deficit, and it pissed my, it made my mother angry, and she decided that she would memorize this, and then explain it to the teacher later, so the teacher wouldn't give her such a hard time. Uh, she had an older sister that was brilliant, and, uh, because of that, uh, they treated uh, everyone else in the family like they were second-class citizens. It was back in the in the 1920s. Anyway, uh, my mother memorized this, and she remembered it after 90 years, almost verbatim. She only ma she only made one mistake, and um, uh, when she talked about the poem, she said, "You know, I made that mistake uh, when I recited it to my teacher," and. Uh, we looked in the book, and it turned out that the book was wrong. <laughs> the book was printed wrong. <laughs> so it was in one of her readers, and they, they printed it incorrectly. And she still remembered the, the mistake instead of the, the actual uh, poem. Uh, I looked it up, and uh, we were I was quite amazed that she, she had remembered the thing. Uh, anyway, so that's memory. We're talking about memory today. Okay, there we go. Psychologists refer to storing memories as in as an encoding process, a procedure for transforming something a person sees, hears, thinks, or feels into a memory. Scientists <clears throat> have determined there are different methods 
in how we lay down our memories. Uh, automatic uh, processing is the encoding of details like time, space, frequency, and the meaning of words. Automatic pro processing is usually done without any conscious awareness. Recalling the last time you studied for a test is an example of automatic processing. But what about the actual test material you studied? Uh, it probably required a lot of work and attention on your part in order to encode that information. This is known as effortful processing. So some, some things go into our brains and that's automatic. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, try to remember them, but, but it sticks. And then there are things that we, try, that we try to force ourselves to remember, and that's effortful processing. You can encode information according to its sound. Uh, that's the acoustic code, uh, what it looks like, the visual code, or what it means. That would be the semantic code. Suppose, for example, that you're trying to remember these three types of encoding from your notes. You might say uh, each of the terms aloud and encode the, the sounds of the words. That would be uh, an acoustic code. Uh, you might see the three types of encoding on your page and visualize the way that the words look. This is visual code. Or uh, you might think about the meanings of each of the terms. That's a semantic code. Uh, once upon a time, I tried to learn French by listening to tapes. And what I found was that uh, I, could, I could repeat the words, but uh, I didn't really remember them because I couldn't see them. If I had read them on a page, I would have it would have been easier for me to remember uh, how they are, they are. And this really drives me crazy because I can't speak French and uh, I don't understand the vowel structure. And, but if I read it, I would understand it because I would see it all the time when I, when I was reading it. Uh, but I, couldn't, I didn't learn very much uh, French, only how to, to say select words, but I have no idea what those words look like. And I read a lot, and uh, sometimes um, I'll read a, a novel where the individual uh, will have uh, French phrases, and they don't translate, and it just drives me crazy because I, I'm not sure if this is the word that I heard because I don't know what it looks like. You know, it gets a little strange. Words that have been encoded semantically were better remembered than those encoded visually or acoustically. Semantic encoding involves a deeper level of processing than the shallower visual or acoustic encoding. Uh, Craig and Tolving uh, concluded that we process verbal information best through semantic encoding, especially if we apply what is called the self-reference effect. The self-reference effect is the tendency for an individual to have better memory for information that relates to oneself in comparison to material that has less personal relevance. So the, the closer it is to anything that has to do with you, the more likely that you will remember it. And that's known as a self-reference effect. Uh, if you try to encode the following sentence, it might give you a little trouble because without context, it is hard to understand. The notes were sour because the seams split. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Material is far better encoded when you make it meaningful. And of course, what we're talking about is a bagpipe. Uh, now that you know it's a bagpipe, the notes were sour because the seam split makes a lot more sense. Uh, if you try to encode the following sentence, it might give you a little trouble because without a context, it is hard to understand. The voyage wasn't delayed because the bottle shattered. Uh, material is far better encoded when you make it meaningful. And what we're talking about is uh, launching a ship with a bottle of champagne. Once again, does it work? The haystack was important because the cloth ripped material is far better encoded when you make it meaningful. And what we're talking about is a parachute. So we're talking about the haystack, landing in the haystack. Well, not in this case, but we're talking about landing in the haystack because his, his uh, parachute ripped. Our brains take the encoded information and place it in storage. Uh, storage is the creation uh, of a permanent record of information uh, in order for a memory to go into storage, uh, uh, for example, long-term memory. It has to pass through the three distinct stages, sensory memory, short-term memory, and finally long-term memory. The Atkinson and Schifrin's model 
is based on the belief that we process memories in the same way that we that a computer processes information. The Atkinson Schifrin model uh, stimuli from the environment are processed uh, first in sensory memory, uh, storage of brief sensory events such as sights, sounds, and tastes. It is very brief storage, up to a couple of seconds. Uh, we're constantly bombarded with sensory information. Uh, we can absorb all of it, or even most of it, and most uh, of it has uh, no impact on our lives. Sensory information we do uh, not view as valuable information we discard. So there's a lot of information coming in right now. Uh, what's going on in the background uh, around your house as you're listening to me? Uh, what you're potentially what you're looking at uh, if you're looking at something on the wall, uh, then that will probably not uh, that will probably be discarded. Short-term memory is a temporary storage system that processes uh, incoming sensory uh, memory. Uh, the terms short-term and working memory are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are not exactly the same. Short-term memory is, is more accurately uh, described as a component of working memory. Short-term memory takes information from the sensory memory and sometimes connects that memory to something already in long-term memory. Short-term memory storage lasts uh, 15 to 30 seconds. So if you don't process it in 15 to 30 seconds, you lose it. Rehearsal uh, moves information from short-term memory to long-term memory. Uh, active rehearsal is a way to attend uh, to information to move it from short-term to long-term memory. During active rehearsal, you, you repeat practice. You repeat or practice the information to be remembered. If you repeat it enough, it may be moved into long-term memory. I think that's putting spears. Well, maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> in 1956, George Miller reviewed uh, most of the research on capacity of short-term memory and found that people can retain between five and nine items. So he reported the capacity of short-term memory was the magic number seven plus or minus two. Uh, however, more contemporary research has found working Memory capacity is 4 plus or minus 1. Uh, generally, re recall is somewhat better for random numbers than for random letters, and also uh, often slightly better for information we hear acoustic encoding rather than information we see visual encoding. Long-term memory uh, is the continuous storage of information. Unlike short-term memory, long-term memory storage capacity is believed to be unlimited. Uh, it encompasses all things you can remember that happened more than just a few minutes ago. It is gener generally accepted that memories are organized in semantic or associative networks. There are two types of long-term memory, explicit and implicit. Uh, understanding the difference between explicit memory and implicit memory is important because aging, particular uh, types of brain trauma and certain disorders can impact explicit and implicit memory in different ways. Explicit memories are those that we consciously try to remember, recall, and report. Explicit memory is sometimes referred to as declarative memory because it can be put into words. Explicit memory is divided into episodic memory and semantic memory. Episodic memory is information that, that events about events that we have personally experienced, uh, for example, an episode. Oh, as an example. The memory of your last birthday is an episodic memory. Uh, usually episodic memory is reported as a story. Episodic memory is memory about happenings in particular places at particular times and what and where and when uh, of an event. It involves recollection of visual imagery as well as the feeling of familiarity. Semantic memory is knowledge about words, concepts, and language-based uh, knowledge and facts. Uh, semantic memory is typic typically reported as facts. Semantic means having to do with language and knowledge about language. Implicit memories are long-term memories that are not part of our consciousness. Although implicit memories are learned uh, outside of our awareness and cannot be consciously recalled, implicit memory is demonstrated in the performance of uh, some task. 
implicit memories can influence observable behaviors as well as cognitive tasks. Implicit procedural memory stores uh, information about the way to, to do something, and it is the memory uh, for skilled actions such as brushing your teeth, riding a bicycle, or driving a car. You were probably not that good at riding a bicycle the first time you tried, but you were much better after doing those things for a year. Your improved bicycle riding was due to learn, uh, learning balancing abilities. Uh, you likely thought about staying upright in the beginning, but now you just do it. Uh, moreover, you probably are good at staying balanced, but cannot tell someone the exact way you do it. Implicit priming is another type of implicit memory. During priming, exposure to a stimulus affects the response to a later stimulus. Stimuli can vary and may include words, pictures, and other stimuli to elicit a response or increase recognition. Implicit emotional conditioning is, is the type of memory involved in classically conditioned emotional responses. These emotional relationships cannot be reported or recalled, but can be associated with different stimuli. For example, specific smells can cause specific emotional responses for some people. If there is a smell that makes you feel positive and nostalgic, and you don't know where the, that response comes from, it is an implicit emotional response. Similarly, most people have a song that causes a specific emotional response. Uh, that uh, song's effect could be an implicit emotional memory. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, the act of getting information out of uh, memory storage and back into consciousness, conscious awareness is known as retrieval. Uh, our ability to retrieve information from uh, long-term memory is vital to our uh, everyday functioning. You must be able to retrieve information from memory in order to do everything, uh, from knowing how to brush your hair and teeth to driving to work or uh, to knowing how to perform your job once you get there. Good dog. You save the child from getting in the mud, and then you went and, and retrieved whatever it was she was trying to get out of the water. <laughs> there he goes. There he got the toy. Good job. There are three ways uh, you can retrieve information out of your long-term memory uh, storage system. Uh, recall, recognition, and relearning. Recall is uh, what we most often think about uh, when we talk about memory retrieval. It means you can access information without cues. For example, you would use recall for an essay test. Recognition uh, happens when you identify information that you have previously learned after encountering it again. It involves a process of comparison. When you take a multiple choice test, you are relying on recognition to help you choose the correct answer. Let's say you graduated from high school 10 years ago and you have returned to your hometown for your 10 year reunion. You may not be able to recall all of your classmates, but you recognize many of them based on their yearbook uh, photos. The third form of retrieval is relearning, and it's just about uh, what it sounds like. It uh, involves learning information that you previously learned. Whitney took Spanish in high school, but after high school, she did not have the opportunity to speak Spanish. Whitney is now 31, and her company has offered her an opportunity to work in Mexico City office. In order to prepare herself, she enrolls in a Spanish course at the local community center. She's surprised at how quickly she's able to pick up the language after not speaking it for 13 years. This is an example of these learning. The same thing happened to me when uh, I took uh, Spanish in high school, two years of Spanish in high school, and two years of Spanish in college. Uh, but it wasn't really conversational Spanish. It was kind of like, well, it was reading. Uh, and I can read Spanish to this day, but I can't speak it very well. Anyway, uh, when we were, uh, when I was stationed in, in Europe, we were playing a, uh, the European Championship softball tournament in uh, in Madrid, Spain, and uh, we went downtown, and uh, and I a could actually understand what people were saying to me. That was, that was weird. I hadn't spoken Spanish, and uh, this was in, uh, what, 81? Well, I hadn't spoken Spanish since uh, 71, 
no, seven sixty nine, and here it was nineteen eighty one, and I understood what they were talking about. Uh, the main job of the amygdala is to uh, regulate emotions such as fear and aggression. Uh, the amygdala plays a part in how memories are stored because storage is influenced by stress hormones. Because of its role in processing uh, emotional information, the amygdala is also involved in memory consolidation, the process of transferring new learning into long-term memory. Uh, the amygdala seems to facilitate encoding memories at a deeper level when the event is emotionally arousing. The hippocampus is involved in memory, specifically normal rec uh, recognition memory, as well as special memory, when the memory tasks are like uh, recall tests. Uh, another job of hippocampus is to pro project information to cortical regions uh, that give memories meaning and connect them with other memories. Uh, it also plays a part in memory consolidation, uh, the process of transferring new learning into long-term memory. And that's what the hippocampus looks like. It's right there. It's right there. And you saw the amygdala, which is right at the end of the hippocampus. Oh. Injury to the hippocampus leaves us unable to process new declarative memories. One famous patient known for years only as HM had both his left and right temporal lobes, the hippocampi, uh, removed in an attempt to help control seizures he had been suffering uh, from for years. As a result, his declarative memory was significantly affected and he could not form new semantic uh, knowledge. Uh, he lost the ability to form new memories, yet he could still remember information and events that had occurred prior to the surgery. And this is the actual guy. Uh, they finally uh, started talking about who he actually was, and this is him. As you can see, he's in a wheelchair. He, he's no longer with us, by the way. Uh, although the hippocampus seems to be more of a processing area for explicit memories, you could still lose it and be able to create implicit memories. Uh, procedural memory, motor learning, and classical conditioning. And that's thanks to the cerebellum, which is, seems to be uh, where your knee-jerk reactions occur. Other researchers have used brain scans, including positron emission tomography, uh, to learn how people process and retain information. From these studies, it seems the prefrontal cortex is involved. Uh, recall is much better for a semantic task than for a perceptual task. According to PET scans, there is much more activation in the left in, in inferior prefrontal cortex than the semantic task. Studies have shown that encoding is associated with left frontal activity, while retrie retrieval of information is associated with the right frontal region. So if you had a blow to your head, uh, you, you would still be able to retrieve information as long as the blow wasn't to the right side of the of your forehead, uh, and this has this is, has something to do with amnesia. If you get a blow to the left side of your head, you can't process information, you can't encode information anymore. If you get a blow to the right side of your of your uh, forehead, uh, then you you uh, have difficulty retrieving information. There are also appears to be specific neurotransmitters involved with the process of memory, such as epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and acetylcholine. There continues to be uh, discussion and, de and debate among researchers as to which neurotransmitter plays which specific role. Although we don't uh, yet know which role each neurotransmitter plays in memory, uh, we do know that communication among neurons via neurotransmitters is critical for developing new memories. Repeated activity by neurons leads to increased neurotransmitters in the synapses and more efficient and more synaptic connections. This is how memory consolidation occurs. It is also believed that strong emotions trigger the formation of strong memories and weaker emotional experiences form weaker memories. This is called the arousal theory. This is uh, written by Christensen in 1992. For example, strong emotional experiences can trigger the release of neurotransmitters as well as hormones, which strengthen memory. Therefore, our memory for an emotional event is usually better than our memory for a non-emotional event. 
when humans and animals are stressed, the brain secretes more of the neurotransmitter glutamate, which helps them remember the stressful event. A flashball memory is an exceptionally clear recollection of an important event. Most likely you can remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. In fact, a Pew Research Center in 2011 uh, survey found that for those Americans who were age 8 or older at the time of the event, 97% can recall the moment they learned of this event, even a decade after it happened. And of course, I can remember where I was. I was uh, just arriving uh, on the Fort Belknap campus, uh, and a, a friend of mine uh, told me that there was had been an attack. Uh, we were sent home that day, and uh, I... I uh, I had just gotten up there and I didn't have any way of communicating. I didn't have a television or a radio. So I was, uh, and, and the uh, internet was spotty. So I had a difficult time uh, keeping up with what was going on. There are two common types of amnesia, anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is commonly caused by brain trauma, such as a blow to the head. With anterograde amnesia, you cannot remember new information although you can remember information and events that happened prior to your injury. The, the hippocampal, hippocampus is usually affected by, uh, by the blow to the head, by the trauma. This suggests that damage to the brain has resulted in the inability to transfer information from short-term to long-term memory, that is, the inability to consolidate memory. Retrograde amnesia is a loss of memory for events that occurred prior to the trauma. People with retrograde amnesia cannot remember some or even all of their past. They have difficulty remembering episodic memories. The formulation of new memories is sometimes called construction, and the process of bringing up old memories is called reconstruction. Yet as we retrieve our memories, we also tend to alter and modify them. A memory pulled from long-term storage into short-term memory is flexible. Uh, new events can be added and we can change what we think we remember about past events, resulting in inaccuracies and distortions. People not, uh, may not intend to distort facts, but it can happen in the process of retrieving old memories and combining them with new memories. When someone witnesses a crime, that person's memory of the details of the crime is very important in catching the suspect. Because memory is so fragile, witnesses can be easily and often accidentally misled due to the uh, problem of suggestibility. Suggestibility describes the effects of misinformation from external uh, sources that leads to the creation of false memory. Even though memory and the process of reconstruction can be fragile, Police officers, prosecutors, and the courts often rely on eyewitness identification and testimony in the prosecution of criminals. However, faulty eyewitness identification and testimony can lead to wrongful convictions. Cognitive psychologist uh, Elizabeth Loftus has conducted extensive research on memory. She has studied false memories as well as recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. Loftus also developed the misinformation effect paradigm which holds that after exposure to additional and possibly inaccurate information, a person may misremember the uh, original event. According to Loftus, an, an eyewitness's memory of an event is very flexible due to the misinformation effect. The idea that memories of trauma, traumatic events could be repressed has been a theme in the field of psychology beginning with Sigmund Freud, and the controversy surrounding the idea continues today. Recall of false autobiographical memories is called false memory syndrome. This syndrome has received a lot of publicity, particularly as it relates to, to memories of events that do not have independent witnesses. Often and only witnesses to the abuse are the perpetrator and the victim. And this is, of course, uh, one of the problems with, uh, with recalling sexual abuse. Research suggests that having no memory of childhood sexual abuse is quite common in adults. One large-scale study conducted by John Breer and John Conte in 1993 revealed that 59% of, of 450 women, uh, men and women who were receiving treatment for sexual abuse that had occurred before age 18 had, for, had forgotten their experiences. 
59%. Sometimes memory loss happens uh, before the actual memory process begins, which is, is that we can't remember something if we never stored it in our memory in the first place. Often in order to remember something, we must pay attention to the details and actively work to process the information. Of course, that's known as effortful encoding. Lots of times we don't do this, and that is, uh, causes encoding failure. Forgetting errors, transience, uh, means that uh, memories can fade over time. Uh, what is going on in st is storage decay. Uh, unused information tends to fade with passage of time. In 1885, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus uh, analyzed the process of memorization and found that due to storage decay, an average person will lose 50% of the memorized information after 20 minutes and 70% of the information after 24 hours. Uh, their memory for new information decays quickly and then eventually levels out. We are all prone to committing the memory error known as absent-mindedness, uh, which describes lapses in memory caused by breaks in attention or our focus being elsewhere, uh, somewhere else. Um, when, when I was when I was teaching at uh, at the college uh, and going from my office to the uh, to the classroom, I had to uh, I, I packed up all my stuff and I, and I took off uh, in time to get there before I needed to be there. Uh, but one of the things that I had to always do was make sure I had everything that I wanted. Uh, that I hadn't forgotten anything, uh, that uh, I had my shoes on or whatever. Uh, I never forgot my pants. Of course, I never took my pants off at work, but that's, uh, you know, um, I had to make sure I had my, my briefcase <laughs> and my backpack and, and, uh, and everything I needed. Because uh, sometimes you just, uh, you're thinking about something else and you just forget things. Not usually your pants. Actually, that's a dream I keep having, is the fact that I'm going to class and I've forgotten my pants, I can't find them, and now I have to run around campus looking for them. It's, it's, it's one of those horror stories, I guess. With blocking, you can't access uh, stored information. Uh, this is also called the tip-of-the-tongue phenomenon, blocking. Uh, as funny as that is. Misattribution happens when you confuse the source of your information. With the mis misattribution, you create the false memory entirely on your own. With su suggestibility, the misinformation comes from someone else, such as a therapist or police interviewer asking leading questions of a witness during an interview. And this is known as suggestibility. Schachter in 2001 says that your feelings and the view of the world can actually distort your memory of past events. Stereotypical bias involves racial and gender biases. Uh, egocentric bias uh, involves enhancing our memories of the past. Hindsight bias happens when we think an outcome has inevitable, uh, was inevitable after the fact. This is the I knew it all along phenomenon. Uh, so those are three different biases. When you keep remembering something to the point where you can't get it out of your head and it interferes with your Ability to concentrate on other things, it is called persistence. Persistence is actually a failure of your memory system because you involuntarily recall unwanted memories, particularly unpleasant ones. Many veterans of military conflicts involuntarily recall unwanted, uh, unpleasant events. If you wake up with a song in your head and you can't get it out all, all through the day, it's known as a memory worm. And uh, uh, I, I had those. I, I have those all the time. I'll wake up with a song in my head and I can't get it out of my head. It's an earworm. I'm sorry. It's known as an earworm. Sometimes uh, information is stored in our memory, but for some reason it is inaccessible. This is known as interference, and there are two types, proactive interference and retroactive interference. Proactive interference is when old information hinders the recall of newly learned information. Retroactive interference happens when information learned more recently hinders the recall of older information. Uh, if you're working with a computer and you get a new computer, then the, uh, you, you try to use the new computer the same way you use the old computer, 
uh, that would be uh, retroactive interference. No, that's proactive interference, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> to help make sure information goes from short-term memory to long-term memory, you can use memory enhancing strategies. One uh, strategy is rehearsal or the uh, conscious repetition of information to be remembered. After memory enhancing, these are all mnemonics. Mnemonics are uh, uh, things to help you remember things. Rehearsal is one way to do it. That's what he's using. He's repeating things. Of course, he gets his fork and his knife mixed up. Another memory enhancing strategy is chunking, where you organize information into manageable bits or chunks. Chunking is useful when trying to remember information like dates and phone numbers. Instead of trying to remember 520-555-0467, you remember the number as 520-555-0467. This is chunking. Uh, you can enhance memory by using elaborative rehearsal, which is a technique in which you think about the meaning of new information and its relation to knowledge already stored in your memory. Elaborative rehearsal involves both linking the information to knowledge already stored and repeating the information. So it is rehearsal. Mnemonic devices are memory aids that help us organize information for encoding. They are especially useful when we want to recall larger bits of information such as steps, stages, phases, and parts of the system. Now, this is one I, I had to use. Uh, I still use it to this day. <laughs> when I was in basic training, we needed to know uh, what they called a one-star general, a two-star general, a three-star general, and a four-star general. So if somebody said, the major general's coming, we would know that it's the guy with the two stars. Uh, and the way that we did this is, is uh, with a mnemonic, be my little general. Uh, a brigadier general has one star, a major general has two, a lieutenant general has three, and a general has four. That's the only way we could remember it. Another one, uh, this is when I was, I played the saxophone when I was in uh, elementary and, and high school. And what I needed you need to know which letters or what uh, notes you're going to play. And the treble clef was always fine, always fine. Oh, uh, good boys uh, do fine always, or all cows eat grass. And the, uh, I can't think of the other clef. The other, the normal clef was uh, every good boy does fine. Uh, e, G, B, D, F. Uh, this is how you remember the, um, uh, the planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and, and that's in order from the Sun out. Uh, Mercury is the closest to the Sun, then Venus, then Earth, and Mars, and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And you can remember it by my, my very educated mother just served as noodles. That's how you can remember it. Use elaborative rehearsal in a, in a famous article, Fergus Crake and Robert Lockhart in 1972 discussed their brief information, uh, that brief, inf their belief that information we process were deeply, more deeply goes into long-term memory. Their theory is called levels of processing. If we want to remember a piece of information, we should think about it more deeply and link it to other information and mem memories to make it more meaningful. Wow. Oh, we're talking about how to study. Uh, apply the self-reference effect as you go through the process of, la of elaborative rehearsal. It would be even more beneficial to make the material you're trying to memorize personally meaningful for you. Uh, write notes in your own words, write definitions from the text, and then rewrite them in your own words. Relate the material to something you have already learned from another class or think how you can apply the concepts to your own life. You are building a web of retrieval cues that will uh, help you access the material when you want to remember it. Make it personal. Use uh, distributed practice uh, study across time in short durations rather than trying to cram it all in, in uh, 
all at once. Memory consolidation takes time, and studying across time allows time for memories to consolidate. Cramming can cause the links between concepts to become so active that you get stuck in a link and it prevents you from accessing the rest of the information that you learned. And maybe you had this problem when you were taking a test. Uh, you started taking a test and, and by golly, the same piece of information keeps flipping around in your head. And uh, so you remember one part of the test, but you can't remember the rest. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Uh, review the material over time and space and organize study sessions. Organize and study your notes and take practice quizzes uh, or exams. Uh, link the new information to other information you, you already know well. Study efficiently. Uh, students are, are great highlighters, but highlighting is not very efficient because students spend too much time studying the things they already learned. Instead of highlighting, use index cards. Uh, write the question on one side and the answer on the other side. When you study, sep uh, separate your cards into those that you got right and those that you got wrong. Study the ones that you got wrong, of course. Uh, be aware of interference. Uh, to reduce the likelihood of interference, study during the quiet time without interruptions or distractions like television or music. Uh, or a puddle. <laughs> what a good dog. <laughs> Uh, keep moving. You already know the, that exercise is good for your body, but it's also good for your mind. Research suggests that regular aerobic exercise, anything to get your heart rate elevated, is beneficial for memory. Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis, uh, the growth of new brain cells in the hippocampus, an area of the brain known as, uh, to play a role in memory and learning. Get enough sleep while you are sleeping, your brain is still at work. During sleep, the brain organizes and consolidates information to be stored in long-term memory. The reality is if you don't sleep, uh, then uh, nothing will go into your long-term memory. So you need to uh, take, at least take a nap uh, so that information will get jammed into your long-term memory. Make use of mnemonic devices. As you learned earlier in the chapter, mnemonic devices often help us to remember and recall information. There are different types of mnemonic devices, such as the acronym. An acronym is a word formed by the first letter of each of the words that we want to remember. And we've already looked at Be My Little General, and Every Good Boy Does Fine. Um, my Very Fine Mother. My Very Excellent Mother served us noodles or something like that. Anyway, that's the end of chapter eight. Get rid of this. There we go. Let's start on chapter 10. Emotion and motivation, chapter 10. Motivation describes the wants or needs that direct behavior toward a goal. Uh, in addition to biological motives, motivations can be intrinsic, arising from internal factors, or extrinsic arising from external factors. Intrinsically motivated behaviors are performed because of the sense of personal satisfaction that they bring, while extrinsically motivated behaviors are performed in order to receive something from others. While you are currently in college, uh, if you are here because you enjoy learning and want to pursue an education to make yourself a more well-rounded individual, you are intrinsically motivated. If you are here because you want to, to get a college degree to make yourself more marketable for a high-paying career or to satisfy the demands of your parents, then your motivation is more extrinsic in nature. There is an old adage, choose a job that you love and you will never have to work a day in your life, meaning that if you enjoy your, your occupation, work doesn't seem like, well, work. According to research, receiving uh, some sort of extrinsic reinforcement, such as getting paid for engagement, Engaging in behaviors that we enjoy leads to those behaviors being thought of, of as work no longer providing that same enjoyment. As a result, we might spend less time engaging in these reclassified behaviors in the absence of any extrinsic reinforcement. Studies suggest that intrinsic motivation may not be so vulnerable to the effects of extrinsic reinforcement, and in fact, reinforcement such as verbal praise might actually increase 
intrinsic motivation. Culture may influence motivation in collect collectivistic cultures. It is common to do things for your uh, family members because the emphasis is on the group and uh, what is best for the entire group rather than what is best for any one individual. This focus on uh, others provides a broader perspective that takes into account both the situational and cultural influences on behavior. In educational uh, settings, uh, students are more likely to experience intrinsic motivation uh, to learn when they feel as a sense of belonging and respect in the classroom. This internalization can be enhanced if the evaluative aspects of the classroom are de-emphasized and if students feel that they exercise uh, some control over the learning environment. William James uh, was an important contributor to early research and motivation, and he is often referred to as the father of psychology in the United States. James theorized that behavior was driven by a number of instincts which aid survival. From, from a biological perspective, an instinct is a species-specific pattern of behavior that is not learned. There was considerable controversy among James and his contemporaries over the exact definition of instinct. James proposed several dozen special human instincts, but many of these uh, of his contemporaries had their own lists that uh, differed. A mother's protection of her baby, the urge to lick sugar, and hunting uh, prey were among the human behaviors proposed as true instincts during James's era. This view that human behavior is driven by instincts received a fair criticism, amount of criticism because of the undeniable role of learning in shaping all sorts of human behavior. In fact, as early as the 1900s, some instinctive behaviors were experimentally demonstrated to result from associative learning. According to the drive theory of motivation, deviations from homeostasis create uh, physiological needs, uh, these uh, needs result in psychological drive states that direct behavior to meet the need and ultimately to bring the system back to homeostasis. Hunger is a drive state that induces eating, which brings the blood sugar and therefore the body back to homeostasis. A habit is a pattern of behavior in which we regularly engage. Once we have engaged in a behavior that successfully reduces a drive, we are more likely to engage in that behavior whenever faced with that drive in the future. Extensions of drive theory uh, take into account levels of arousal as potential motiva motivators. These theories uh, assert that there is an optimal level of arousal that we all try to, to maintain. Uh, if we are under aroused, we become bored and will seek out some sort of stimulation. If we are over-aroused, we will engage in behaviors to reduce our arousal. Students tend to be over-aroused at finals time, but generally by the next fall, many students are quite happy to return to school. Research uh, shows that the level that leads to the best performance is moderate arousal. When arousal is very high or very low, performance tends to suffer. And this is according to Yerkes and Dodson in 1908. Researchers Yerkes and Dotson discovered that the optimal arousal level depended on the complexity and difficulty of the task to be performed. Yerkes Dotson law holds that a simple task is performed best when arousal levels are relatively high and complex tasks are best performed when arousal levels are low. And this is Yerkes and Dotson. That's Yerkes on the top and that's Dotson on the bottom. Self-efficacy is an individual's belief in her own ability, a capability to complete a task, which may include a previous successful completion of the exact task or a similar task. Albert Bandura in 1994 theorized that an individual's sense of self-efficacy plays a pivotal role in motivating behavior. Bandura, Bandura argues that motivation derives from expectations that we have about the consequences of our behaviors, and ultimately, it is the appreciation of our capacity to engage in a given behavior that will determine what we do and the future goals that we set for ourselves. Some theorists have focused their research on understanding social motives. Among the motives they describe are needs for achievement, affiliation, and intimacy. 
It is the need for achievement that drives accomplishment and performance. Uh, the need for affiliation encourages positive interactions with others. And the need for intimacy causes us to seek deep, meaningful relationships. Affiliation is the one that you need to remember here. Affiliation has to do with uh, interacting with others. Abraham Maslow in 1943 proposed a hierarchy of needs that spans the spectrum of motives, ranging from the biological to the individual to the social. These needs are often depicted as a pyramid. And as you can see at the bottom of the pyramid are your physiological needs. And of course, these have to be met first. We need water, food, uh, shelter, sleep, clothing, reproduction. Uh, the next level is your safety needs, your personal security, employment, resources, health, property. Uh, the next level is love and belonging, friendship, intimacy, family, uh, sense of connection. And then esteem is the next level and self-actualization is the last level. Uh, and of course, uh, as far as we're dealing with this, if you're a social worker uh, and you're, you're interacting with uh, somebody that is in need, uh, the first thing you need to make sure is that their physiological needs are taken care of. And secondly, that their safety needs are taken care of. Then you can worry about all the other things uh, that uh, uh, you're dealing with. At the base of the pyramid are, are all the physiological needs that are necessary for survival. These are followed by basic needs for security and safety that need to be loved, the need to be loved and to have a sense of belonging and the need to have self-worth and confidence. The top tier of the pyramid is self-actualization, which is a need that essentially equates to achieving one's full potential. And it can only be realized when needs uh, lower on the pyramid have been met. To Maslow and humanistic theorists, self-actualization reflects the humanistic emphasis on positive aspect, aspects of human nature. Maslow suggested, suggested that this is an ongoing lifelong process that only a small percentage of people actually achieve as a self-actualized state. There are a number of physiological mechanisms that serve as the basis for hunger. Now we're going to deal with hunger. We dealt with motivation. Now we're going to deal with hunger. Uh, when our stomachs are empty, they contract. Uh, typically, a person then experiences hunger pangs. Uh, chemical messenger messages travel to the brain and serve as a signal to initiate feeding behavior. When our blood glu glucose levels drop, the pancreas and liver generate a number of chemical signals that induce hunger and thus initiate feeding behavior. For most people, once they have eaten, they uh, feel satiation or fullness and satisfaction, and their eating behavior will stop. Like the initiation of eating, satiation is also regulated by several physiological mechanisms. As blood uh, glucose level increases, the pancreas and the liver send signals to shut off hunger and eating. The food's uh, passage through the gastrointestinal tract also provides important satiating signals to the brain, and fat cells release leptin, a satiety hormone. And this is one of the this is something that you need to remember that leptin is released by fat cells. The various hunger and satiety signals that are involved in the regulation of eating are integrated uh, in the brain. Uh, research suggests that several areas of the hypothalamus and the hindbrain are especially important sites where this integration occurs. Ultimately, activity in the brain uh, determines whether or not we engage in feeding behavior. And that is your hypothalamus right there, that lump of red, as you can see, as it twists around. There you go. And right below it is the pituitary gland, anyway, the hypothalamus. Our body weight is affected by a number of factors, including gene uh, environment uh, interactions and the number of calories we consume versus the number of calories we burn in daily activity. If our caloric intake exceeds our, calor our caloric use, our bodies store excess energy in the form of fat. If we consume fewer calories uh, than we burn off, then stored fat will be converted to en energy. Our energy expenditure is obviously affected by our levels of activity, but our body's metabolic rate also comes into play. A person's metabolic rate is the amount of energy that is expended in a given period of time 
and there is tremendous individual variability in our metabolic rates. People with high rates of metabolism are able to burn off calories more easily than those with lower rates of metabolism. The set point theory asserts that each individual has an uh, ideal body weight or a set point which is resistant to change. The set point is genetically predetermined and efforts to move our weight significantly from the set point are resisted by compensatory changes in energy intake uh, and or expenditure. And these are the five different types of uh, uh, body types. Uh, you have a pear, you have an inverted triangle, an apple, a rectangle, and an hourglass. My weight set point is somewhere in the, somewhere between 185 and 195. Uh, before COVID, uh, I was bouncing between 185 and 190. Uh, since COVID, I've been bouncing uh, uh, between 190 and uh, 196, 195. Uh, but it, it very rarely uh, fluctuates too much. Uh, anyway, that's my weight set point. Uh, when someone weighs more than uh, what is generally accepted as healthy for a given height, they are considered overweight or obese. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, an adult with a body mass index uh, between 25 and 29.9 is considered overweight. An adult with a BMI of 30 or higher is considered obese. People who are so overweight that they are at risk for death are classified as morbidly obese. Anything over 40 is considered mor morbidly obese. Being extremely overweight or obese is a risk factor for several negative health of, uh, consequences. Uh, these include, but are not limited to, an in increased risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, liver disease, sleep apnea, colon cancer, breast cancer, infertility, and arthritis. Given that it is estimated that in the United States around one-third of the adult population is obese, and that nearly two-thirds of adults and one in six children qualify as overweight, there is substantial interest in trying to understand how to combat this important public health concern. Generally overweight and obese individuals are encouraged to try to reduce their weights through a combination of both diet and exercise. While some people are very successful with these approaches, many struggle to lose excess weight. Bariatric surgery is a type of surgery specifically aimed at weight reduction, and it involves modifying the gastrointestinal system to reduce the amount of food that can be eaten and or limited, limiting how much of the digestive food uh, can be absorbed. A recent meta-analysis suggests that bariatric surgery is more effective than non-surgical treatment for obesity in the two, year, two years immediately following the procedure. And as you can see, uh, in some of these, they're uh, restructuring the stomach. Uh, in others, they're just pinching it off as with the lap band. Uh, the uh, picture in your book uh, shows a lap band procedure. But there are a number of ways you can uh, uh, you can get around your stomach. People suffering from bulimia nervosa engage in binge eating behavior that is followed by an attempt to compensate for the large amount of food consumed. Purging the food by inducing vomiting or through the use of laxatives are two common compensatory behaviors. Some affected individuals engage in excessive amounts of exercise to compensate for their binges. Bulimia is associated with many adverse health consequences that can include kidney failure, heart failure, and tooth decay. In addition, these individuals often suffer from anxiety and depression, and they are at an increased risk for substance abuse. The lifetime prevalence rate for bulimia nervosa is estimated at around 1% for women and less than 0.5% for men. Now, one of the reasons why you have a problem with tooth decay is because uh, you stick your fingers down your throat and force yourself to uh, vomit. When the uh, vomitus comes up, 
Uh, it uh, washes into your mouth and the back of your teeth, the uh, stomach uh, acids uh, eat, eat away the back of your teeth, uh, making what they refer to as shadow teeth. Unlike with bulimia, binge eating disorder is not followed by inappropriate behaviors such as purging, but they are followed by distress including feelings of guilt and embarrassment. The resulting psychological distress distinguishes binge eating disorder from overeating. And uh, I found a picture, I found a lot of pictures, and some of them were pretty nasty. Uh, this is a normal sized person who is just eating like crazy. Uh, the others were a little bit insulting. Uh, some morbidly obese people that were binge eating. There was one of a, a lady that said, when she's eating and uh, she hasn't finished all of her food, she massages her stomach uh, to force more food down into her stomach. It was really kind of strange. Anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder characterized by the maintenance of a body weight well below the average through starvation and or excessive exercise. Individuals suffering from anorexia nervosa often have a distorted body image uh, referenced in literature as a type of body dysmorphia, meaning that they view themselves as overweight even though they are not. Like bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa is associated with a number of significant negative health outcomes, bone loss, heart failure, kidney failure, amenorrhea, cessation of the menstrual periods, uh, reduced function of the gonads, and in extreme cases, death. Furthermore, there, there is an increased risk for a number of psychological problems, which include anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and substance abuse. Estimates of the prevalence of anorexia nervosa vary from study to study, but generally range from just under 1% to just over 4% in women. Generally, prevalence rates are considerably lower for men. While both anorexia and bulimia nervosa occur in men and women of many different cultures, Caucasian females from Western societies tend to be the most at-risk population. Recent research indicates that females between the ages of 15 and 19 are most at risk, and it has long been suspected that these eating disorders are culturally bound phenomena that are related to the messages of a thin ideal often portrayed in popular media and especially the fashion world, as you can see, all these women are anorexic, they look anorexic to me. There is considerable evidence that sexual motivation, now we're going to talk about human sexuality, uh, there is considerable evidence that sexual motivation for both men and women varies as a function of circulating testosterone levels, though many people have been scandalized by psychology's interest in sexual relations. Freud's identification of sexual repression causing social and mental problems has made sex a ripe subject, subject for research. Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s described a remarkably diverse range of sexual behaviors and experiences in his research. You have to understand that uh, before Kinsey in the 1940s, uh, people thought everybody did everything exactly the same. Uh, society dictated uh, everything, including your sexual behavior. Behaviors that had once been considered exceedingly rare or problematic were demonstrated to be much more common and innocuous than previously imagined. To show this, Kinsey developed a continuum known as the Kinsey Scale that is still commonly used today to categorize an individual's sexual orientation. According to that scale, sexual orientation is an individual's emotional and erotic Attractions to same-sex individuals, homosexual, opposite-sex individuals, heterosexual, or both, or both, bisexual. And that is the Kinsey scale. And I have a, an example of it right here. That's the Kinsey scale. In 1960s, Masters and Johnson measured human response to masturbation and the act of poetess. In total, Masters and Johnson observed nearly 10,000 sexual acts as a part of their research. Based on these observations, Masters and Johnson divided the sexual response cycle into four phases that are fairly similar in men and women. The first stage is the excitement stage, the second is the plateau stage, 
The third is the orgasm, and the last is the resolution stage. The excitement phase is the arousal phase of the sexual response cycle and is marked by the erection of the penis or clitoris and lubrication and expansion of the vaginal canal. During plateau, women experience further swelling of the vagina and increased blood flow to the labia minora, and men experience full erection and often exhibit pre-ejaculatory fluid. Both men and women experience increase, uh, increases in muscle tone during this time. Now these are interesting pictures over here on the right. This is uh, this uh, video actually um, uh, accompanied Masters and Johnson's presentation. So this is actually from the Masters and Johnson presentation. I did, I couldn't find the whole thing. Well, I, I don't usually put those in there. I, I thought this was kind of interesting. Anyway, this is from Masters and Johnson, who eventually got married, by the way. Orgasm is marked in women by rhythmic contractions of the pelvis and uterus, along with increased muscle tension. In men, pelvic contractions are accompanied by a buildup of seminal fluid during the uh, near the urethra that is ultimately forced out by contractions of genital muscles, and this is known as ejaculation. Resolution is a relatively rapid return to unaroused states, uh, accompanied by a decrease in blood pressure and muscular relaxation. While many women can quickly repeat the sexual response cycle, men must pass through a longer refractory uh, period as part of, re of uh, resolution. The refract refractory period is a period of time that follows an orgasm during which an individual is incapable of experiencing another orgasm. In men, the duration of the refractory period can vary dramatically from individual to individual, with some refractory periods as short as several minutes and others as long as a day. As men age, their refractory periods tend to span longer periods of time. While the majority of people identify as heterosexual, there is a sizable population of people within the United States who identify as homosexual, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, or other non-heterosexualities. Research suggests that somewhere between 3% and 10% of the population identifies as homosexual. Bisexual people are attracted to people of their own gender and, other, and another gender, Pansexual people experience attraction without regard to sex, gender identity, or gender expression. Asexual people do not experience sexual attraction or have little or no interest in sexual activity. Regardless of how sexual orientation is determined, research has made clear that sexual orientation is not a choice, but rather it is a relatively stable characteristic of a person that cannot be changed. Claims of successful gay conversion therapy have received wide criticism from the research community uh, due to uh, significant concerns with research design, recruitment of experimental participants, and interpretation of data. As such, there is no credible scientific evidence to suggest that individuals can, be cha can change their sexual orientation, no matter how much you spin them in the air. Uh, once upon a time, there was, in, the, in 2012, the 2012 election, uh, there was a presidential candidate, a young lady from uh, Minnesota, whose husband had made his millions and millions of dollars uh, by doing uh, gay conversion therapy. Uh, and uh, she swore by this, of course. Uh, her name is Michelle Bachman. Uh, she's no longer in politics. She's retired, uh, but her husband is still doing gay conversion therapy, as weird as that may seem. Dr. Spitzer, the author of one of the most widely cited examples of successful conversion therapy, apologized to both the, the scientific community and the gay community for its, his mistakes, and he publicly rec recanted his own paper in a public letter. I believe I owe the gay community an apology for my study making unproven claims of the efficacy of reparative therapy, citing uh, research that suggests not only that gay conversion therapy is ineffective, but also potentially harmful. There have been legislative efforts to make such therapy illegal, and as you can see there, it's illegal in six states, including New Mexico. New York, 
New Jersey and someplace else. Wait a second. Not New Jersey, Maryland, I think. Uh, Washington, D.C. Many people conflate uh, sexual orientation with gender identity because of stereotypical attitudes that exist about gay and lesbian sexuality. In reality, these are two, uh, are two related but different issues. Gender identity refers to one's sense of being male or female. Generally, our gender identities uh, correspond to our chromosomal and phenotypic uh, sex, but this is not always the case. When individuals do not feel comfortable identifying with their gender associated with their biological sex, then they experience gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is a diagnostic category in the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental uh, Disorders, the DSM-5, uh, that describes individuals who do not identify as that, the gender that most people would assume they are. Many people who are classified as gender dysphoric seek to live their lives in ways that are consistent with their own gender identity. This involves dressing in opposite sex clothing and assuming an opposite sex identity. These individuals may also undertake uh, transgender hormone therapy in an attempt to make their bodies look more like the opposite sex, and in some cases they elect to have surgeries to alter the appearance of their external genitalia uh, to resemble that of their gender identity. Uh, curiously, um, my sister married uh, an individual who decided that uh, he wanted to be a female instead, uh, and he is now transgender, if he's still alive. Uh, anyway, she, he was transgender. Now she is transgender. Now she is transgender. Okay. Not my sister, but, but his her former husband. Uh, our scientific knowledge and general understanding about gender identity continues to evolve, and young people today have more opportunity to explore and openly express different ideas about what gender means than previous generations. Recent studies indicate that the majority of millennials, those ages 18 to 34, regard gender as a spectrum instead of a strict male-female binary, and that 12% identify as transgender or gender nonconforming. Additionally, over half the people ages 13 to 20 know people who use gender neutral protein, uh, pronouns, <laughs> pronouns such as they or them. This change in language means that millennials and Generation Z people understand the experience of gender itself differently. As young people lead uh, this chart change, other changes are emerging in a, chain, a range of spheres, from public bathroom policies to retail organizations. Issues related to sexual orientation and gender identity are very much influenced by sociocultural factors. Even the ways in which we define sexual orientation and gender vary from one culture to the next. While in the United States, heterosexuality has historically been viewed as the norm, uh, there are societies that have different attitudes regarding gay behavior. There is, has historically been a two-gendered culture in the United States. We have tended to classify an individual as either male or female. However, in some cultures there are additional gender variants resulting in more than two gender category, categories. Intersex is a broad term referring to people whose bodies are not strictly biologically male or female. Intersex conditions can uh, present at any time during life. Sometimes a child may be born with components of male and female genitals, and other times XY chromosomal differences are present. As we move through our daily lives, we experience a variety of emotions. An emotion is a subjective state of being that we often describe as our feelings. Emotions result from the combination of subjective experience, expression, cognitive appraisal, and physiological responses. Emotional expression refers to the way one displays an emotion and includes nonverbal and verbal behaviors. One also performs a cognitive appraisal in which a person tries to determine the way he or she will be impacted by a situation. 
In addition, emotions include physiological responses such as possible changes in heart rate, sweating, etc. Our emotional states are combinations of physiological arousal, psychological appraisal, and subjective experiences. Together, these are the components of emotion and our experiences, backgrounds, and cultures inform our emotions. Over time, several different theories of emotion have been proposed to explain how the various components of emotion interact with one another. The James Lang theory of emotion asserts that emotions arise from, from physiological arousal. The sympathetic nervous system controls our fight or flight response when threatened. Danger would arouse the sympathetic nervous system to initiate significant physiological arousal, which would make your heart race and increase your respiration rate. According to the James Lang theory of emotion, you would only experience a feeling of fear after this physiological arousal had been had taken place. And that's James on the top, and that's Carl Lang on the bottom. William James. Henry James was his brother. He was a writer. Henry James was a writer. And William James, of course, was a uh, psychologist. And that's Carl Lang from Sweden. The Cannon Bard theory sees the physiological arousal and emotional experience occurring simultaneously yet independently. The emotional reaction would be separate and independent of the phys physiological arousal, even though they co-occur. And this is Cannon right here. Uh, and this is Bard. Bard was a student of Cannon's. And uh, they came up with a theory. The facial feedback hypothesis proposes that your facial expression can actually affect your emotional experience. Research investigating the facial feedback hypothesis suggested that suppression of facial expression or of emotion lowered the intensity of some emotions experienced by participants. Researchers used Botox injections to paralyze facial muscles and limit facial expressions, including frowning, and they found that depressed people reported less depression after their frowning muscles were paralyzed. Other research found that the intensities of facial expressions affected the emotional reactions. A big smile will make you happier about the little thing uh, that, than you uh, would be if you only had a tiny smile. The Schachter-Singer two-factor theory of emotion is another variation on theories of emotions that takes into account both the physiological arousal and the emotional experience. According to this theory, emotions are composed of two factors, physiological and cognitive. Physiological arousal is interpreted in context to produce the emotional experience. And this is uh, Schachter here, and this is Singer on the bottom. The relationship between our experiencing of emotions and our cognitive processing of them and the order in which these occur remains a topic of research and debate. Lazarus developed the cognitive mediational theory that asserts our emotions are determined by our appraisal of the stimulus. This appraisal mediates between the stimulus and the emotional response and it is immediate and often unconscious. In contrast to the Schachter Singer model, the appraisal precedes a cognitive label. We constantly regulate our emotions, and much of our emotion uh, regulation occurs without as us actively thinking about it. Moss and her colleagues studied automatic, uh, this is Iris Moss right here. She's at uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Uh, Moss and her colleagues studied automatic emotion regulation, AER, which refers to the non-deliberate uh, uh, control of emotions. It is simply not reacting to your emotions, and AER can affect all aspects of emotional processes. AER can influence the things you attend to, your appraisal, your choice to engage in an emotional experience, and your behaviors after an emotion is experienced. The idea AER is of, of AER is that people develop an automatic process that works like a script or schema, and the process does not require deliberate thought to regulate emotions. Once you develop the process, you just do it without thinking about it. Moss and her colleagues found that strategies could reduce negative emotions, which in turn 
should increase uh, psychological health. Moss has also suggested there are problems with the way emotions are measured, but she believes most of the aspects of emotions that are typically measured are useful. After about three decades of interdisciplinary research, Lisa Barrett argued that we do not understand emotions. She proposed that emotions uh, were not built into, our, into your brain or at birth, but rather that they were constructed based on your experiences. Emotions in the, in the constructivist theory are predictions that uh, construct our experience of the world. And she's at Harvard, I believe. Zients uh, asserted, uh, this is Robert Zients uh, right here, asserted that some emotions occur separately from or prior to our cognitive interpretation of them, such as feeling fear in response to an unexpected loud sound. Uh, Zients uh, also uh, believed in what we might uh, casually refer to as a gut feeling. Uh, that we can experience an instantaneous and unexplic unexplainable like or dislike for someone or something. Ladeau uh, views some uh, emotions as requiring no cognition. Uh, some emotions completely bypass contextual interpretation. His research into the neuroscience of emotion has demonstrated the amygdala's primary role in fear. A fear stimulus is processed by the brain through one of two paths, uh, from the thalamus where it is perceived, directly to the amygdala, or from the thalamus through the cortex, and then to the amygdala. The first path is quick, while the second enables more processing about details of stimulus. And what Ladeau is actually talking about is the difference between adolescent processing information and adult. Adult pro uh, processing of information usually... Uh, starts at the thalamus and go through the cortex and then the amygdala before it arouses you, before you get aroused. Adolescents, of course, they skip the, uh, the processing part and go right to the amygdala. The amygdala is composed of various subnuclei, including this basolateral complex and the central nucleus. Uh, the basolateral complex has, has dense connections with a variety of sensory areas of the brain. It is critical for classical conditioning and for attaching emotional value to learning processes and memory. The central nucleus uh, plays a role in attention, and it has connections with the hypothalamus and various brainstem areas to regulate the autonomic nervous and endocrine system's activity. And that is, uh, that's your amygdala there. Those red dots. Human research suggests a relationship between the amygdala and psychological disorders of mood or anxiety. Changes in amygdala structure and function have been demonstrated in adolescents who are either at risk or have been diagnosed with various mood or other or and or anxiety disorders. It has also been suggested that functional differences in the amygdala could serve as a biomarker to differentiate individuals suffering from bipolar disorder uh, from those suffering from major depressive disorder. The hippocampus is also involved in emotional processing. Like the amygdala, research has demonstrated that hippocampal structure and function are linked to a variety of mood and anxiety disorders. Individuals suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder uh, show marked reductions in the volume of several parts of the hippocampus, uh, which may result from decreased levels of neurogenesis and dendritic branching, the generation of new neurons and the generation of new dendrites and existing neurons, respectively. While it is impossible to make a causal claim with correlational research like this, studies have demonstrated behavioral improvements in hippocampal uh, volume increases following either pharmacological or cognitive behavioral therapy in individuals suffering from PTSD. Culture can impact the way that, uh, in which people display emotion. A cultural display rule is one of a, co a collection of culturally specific standards that govern the types and frequencies of displays of emotions that are acceptable. Therefore, people from varying cultural backgrounds can have very different cultural display rules of emotion. And actually, this is, uh, let me... Um, relate to you a story. Um, 
my father died and and at his funeral my mother my mother told everybody nobody cried you know this is uh he was he uh, was long suffering and uh this is this is a, a good thing that he died well i have a brother-in-law who's uh, catholic and in the catholic church uh people cried during funerals so uh wh while none of his children were crying uh my my brother-in-law uh, started crying during the funeral services. His his wife didn't cry, but he cried. And the, the reality was that he didn't really like my dad a whole lot. Other distinct cultural characteristics might be involved in emotionality. For instance, uh, there may be gender differences involved uh, in emotional processing. While research into gender differences uh, in emotional display is equivocal, uh, there is some evidence that men and women may differ in regulation of emotions. Emotion is not only displayed through facial expression, we also use the tone of our voices, various behaviors, and body language to communicate information about our emotional states. Body language is the expression of emotion in terms of body position or movement. Research suggests that we are quite sensitive to the emotional information communicated through body language, even if we're not consciously aware of it. And that is the end of the chapter. Uh, like I said, the reason I skipped chapter 9 is because chapter 9 is a area of psychology all by itself. Uh, chapter 8 and chapter 10 actually go together as part of cognitive psychology. So that is the 